Right. About a year ago, just over a year ago, um, at the London Olympics, Tim Berners-Lee said, uh, said this. He's part of the opening ceremony. He said, this is for everyone. That's kind of how we feel about digital public services and gov.uk in general. Um, as a few people have already said, I'm Ben Terrett, Head of Design. This is Josh, Developer and Accessibility Lead. We're going to do that slightly awkward thing where we both talk in the same presentation, so, you know, bear with us. Um, we are civil servants. So we work in the UK Cabinet Office. For those of you that don't know intimately about UK politics, the Cabinet Office is sort of the same thing as, as number 10 Downing Street, really. It sits at the very centre of government and is supposed to work, make government work better. We're the bit, um, the government digital service is the bit that's supposed to make government work better digitally. <coughs> this is um, Maz and Dai. They're also civil servants. Um, and I guess part of what we're doing is a slight organisational change within within the cabinet office, within the civil service, you know, how they approach, approach these things. That's the sort of best picture we've got that illustrates that culture change, really. Um, I'm going to tell you very briefly about gov.uk and some of the design things. Josh is accessibility lead, so he's the sort of more interesting bit. He's going to talk to you about that. And then we'll just do a little bit at the end about our assisted digital program, which we're only really just beginning. Um, and then, obviously, there's questions, or feel free to come up to us at, at lunch or whatever, and we're happy to talk to you about any of that stuff. So Government Digital Service has only been going for about round about two years, um, and it was started by a report that Martha Lane Fox wrote. Martha Lane Fox is um, a digital entrepreneur. She founded the website lastminute.com and various other things, but she was asked by the government to look at all government sort of digital and IT, the, the government's digital estate, really. She wrote a brilliant report. It's incredibly simple. It's about 10 pages. Um, you, can, you can Google it and find it. And it makes four, unlike most of these sort of government reports, it makes four really clear recommendations. Number one is to set up the government digital service. Two is to, is to fix publishing. Three, fix transactions. Four, go wholesale. Publishing is mostly the sort of department, um, corporate kind of websites. You know, each department has got their own websites, news, announcements, that kind of thing. Um, as well as information, had a, we had a big site in the UK called DirectGov, which publishes a lot of information about tax and, and you know that kind of thing. That's mostly what we mean by publishing. Transactions is, is things where there's a two-way exchange between citizen and the government, so buying your car tax online, for example, that kind of thing. Um, that's, that's the bit we're doing now. We've broadly fixed publishing. There's still, still, there's still a lot more to do, but that's, that's up and running, and, and we've broadly done that. We've... When this was started, we had over 2,000, there was over 2,000 government websites in the UK. We've, there's now about 300 left, so about 1,700 have, have gone away, have been closed down or been folded onto the, the gov.uk platform. We're working on transactions right now. Um, there's, a, there's an exemplar program to fix transactions. We're not really going to talk about that much today. Um, and then go wholesale means things like create API so that others can build services upon our services, that kind of thing. I'm just going to play you um, a little video now that explains in about 30 seconds what gov.uk is. Um, I hope everyone can see it and hear it and, it and it kind of works. It should do. Gov.uk is a new website. It's the best place to find government services and information. Gov.uk makes it simpler, clearer and faster for people to get what they need from government. It's got some step-by-step -step guides for things like employing new staff, which can make some complicated processes much easier to understand. You can work out things like maternity pay with the help of some very simple tools. And for things like bank holidays, we put the information most people are looking for right in the middle of the page. Gov.uk. It's simpler, clearer and faster. Have a look at www.gov.uk. So I just want to pick on a, a few of those examples, really. And just, it, I mean, it's a huge website, but I just want to pick on a few things and, and sort of explain what we've done. This is the old DirectGov was the main UK government citizen-facing website, really, where you went to find out um, information that a citizen might need from the government. Um, and this is a, a page on bank holidays. It tells you when the bank holidays in the UK are. Um, and it lists them all. Um, the, the, the screenshot was taken in 2012, so it lists them all for 2012 and the next years. Sort of, in one way, it's hard to think how, how you could do that page better. It's got the information there. Um, I do this presentation a lot, and I could, if we try and find what, what we found from Google search logs and from user research and from talking to people is that when people arrive at that page, the bank holidays page, what I, I don't know, 90 percent of people are looking for, the information they're looking for is when is the next one. 
Um, and if you look at that, if we try and find that on this one, it's kind of, it's kind of buried away there. Um, and the other, the other ones are important. I mean, say you had, for example, bought a restaurant and you thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that up and I'm going to open that restaurant at, at the August bank holiday next year. It's, it's important that you know that information. And crucially, government sets that information. So we decide when the bank holidays are and some of them move. They're, they're, um, they're slightly different in Scotland to how they are in England. So it's important information. But the information that most people want is when is the next one. So we've redesigned that page to be like that, basically. We just make that information really big and really clear and really upfront. Um, that's the information that 90% of people are looking for. It's also slightly depressing because um, in England and Wales, the next bank holiday is Christmas Day, which feels which is 84 days away. So. Um, also, we, we had lots of information ar around the government estate. There was lots of things like this. There's a whole page on direct government about keeping bees. And we, we just don't think that's the thing that government should be telling people to do. There are other better websites that have that information. You know, we kind of believe that government should only do what only government can do. So setting the, telling you when the bank holidays are is a thing that only government can do because we decide when they are. Keeping bees, loads of other people can, you know, you tell you that. Likewise, there was a page on sort, of, on sort of what to do when it gets cold, which said, you know, pull on a pullover. We just don't think that, that, that government should tell you that, really. <laughs> someone, else, someone else should tell you that. So we've got rid of all that content. I can't remember what the stats are, but we archived a load of content, and we really focused on what are the user needs, what are people really trying to do. As I said, we've kind of closed over 1,700 websites, folded them onto the platform. In the UK, there are 24 ministerial departments, so things like the Ministry of Justice, the Home Office, the Foreign Office, so on and so on. All those departments now have their websites on gov.uk. They've all got one look and feel. They've all got one user experience. One of the other sort of key principles that came from Martha's report is that you shouldn't have to relearn some behavior when you go to different parts of government web estate. It should all be the same. Booking a prison visit should be the same experience as booking a driving test. It's just booking a thing, choosing a date. So that user experience should be the same. I think that, that's sort of really key. And they should look and feel the same. People, to the man on the street, it's all government. They don't really understand what different government departments are or what they do. And you know, nor should, there's no real need for them to do that, really. It's just government, and they, and they want to find stuff out. So we've made that, that all the same. It's all fully responsive. It works on, mo on mobile phones. Um, as a designer, you hear lots of these terms, responsive design, mobile first, all that kind of stuff. I'm, I don't really like those terms. I think the more important thing to do is focus on the user need. And the user need for something like this, for me, is um, say I'm, I'm on the bus, I'm on the way to a job interview, and I want to check what the minimum wage is to make sure I don't get, you know, don't get ripped off during this job interview. Should I be able to do that on the bus on my old Nokia phone? Yes, absolutely, of course you should. So that's what's sort of driving that, that mobile responsive stuff, really. Um, I'm just going to show you some screenshots now. It's really hard to just, to, just you know, show websites in presentations like this. So we've just got some screenshots and some close-ups just to give you a feel for how the kind of website looks like, um, some sort of key pages. Some of this it sounds bizarre, but some of this information you just couldn't find out before. It was really hard to find a page telling you what the Prime Minister did and what his roles and responsibilities were and how that's different from the Deputy Prime Minister. We've got that now um, in one place. Um, how many ministers there are and all this kind of stuff. It's hard to, to find that out. That's the, um, that's the VAT rates, which is, just, again, it's the same page as that bank holidays thing. So it's another good example. There are three different types of VAT rates. And again, that's important. We set that. But 95% of people are, are looking, when they ask that question, what is the VAT rate, it's that 20% is the, is the answer they're looking for. Um, as a few people have said, We've won the Design Museum of the Year Award, being the Olympic Cauldron and the Shard and, and all kinds of other wonderful um, projects. Um, and we've got lots of press coverage for that, including this brilliant story in the Daily Mail, which said the award goes to boring.com, um, <laughs> which, which I think is interesting sort of for two reasons, really. Because if we'd have said a few years ago we were going to make a government IT project that was boring, everyone would have bitten our hands off and said, please do make one that you know, is boring. We don't get headlines that say, massive IT project fails, and so on. Um, but also, uh, the reason they're saying it's boring if you read the articles is because on lots of pages we don't have many pictures. And the reason we don't have many pictures is, um, say, that bank holidays page where it tells you when the next bank holiday is, I don't think there's any picture that could improve how you get that information. I mean, what would that picture be that would be, you know, some family on a beach or something? You know, it wouldn't improve how the user got that information. 
So, but it's also interesting. I think that that we don't that we we're focused on ease of use and accessibility, and we don't think that's boring. You know, um, they sort of perceive it as boring, but we don't. And actually, the, the the reason we won the Design Museum Award, if you look at this, quite a there's quite a, um, an esteemed judging panel, and there's quite a lengthy process. They don't just sort of pick one, and then you have to win a category, and they go through it. The reason we won it is, is for ease of use, for making things easier for, for everyday citizens. We didn't win it for aesthetic values or because it's pretty. We won it because it's easy to use, which, which is fantastic. We can only do this because we focus on those, those user needs. Um, and in, I just want to play you another little video now, which, again, I hope everyone can see and hear. It's a, a question asked in Parliament. Our minister is Francis Maud. He's, he's the minister for the Cabinet Office. He was asked a question in Parliament about designing government and so on and so on. And he replied like this. Of the government digital service, which is committed to ensuring that as we uh, reform the delivery of public services, they are designed around the needs of the user rather than has been far too often the case in the past, being designed to suit the convenience of the government. Gary Streeter, Mr. Speaker. I think that's, that's quite an amazing clip, really, that you've got a really senior minister there saying we are redesigning stuff around the user, not around the needs of the government. I think that's quite amazing. Um, that survey, I think it's on our blog, it's on my Flickr. If you Google it, you can find that. I would kind of encourage you to use that with your you know, senior leaders or ministers or, you know, or your, your managers or whatever. If people don't think focusing on user needs is important, I think that's a really good kind of clip to, to help with that. We have a list of, of 10 design principles that we, that we wrote very early on to help us um, sort of do this stuff. Not going to dwell on those today, although we'll happily talk about them at lunch or, or, or so on and so on. But I think the, the most important one for this conference is number six, which is build for inclusion. Um, and I think the, the point there is that we're, we're saying right up front, sort of at the very beginning of this project, build for inclusion and crucially accessible design is good design. Um, I'm kind of a, a graphic designer by training. I don't think there should be any difference really between you know, accessible design and good design. They are the same thing. Um, and Josh is now going to explain more about that. Morning, everyone. Uh, like Ben said, uh, I am the accessibility lead for the Government Digital Service. Uh, so it's part of my work. I look after gov.uk as well as all of the different projects that we're doing alongside the GDS. Uh, some things across government departments and some things across different governments around the world to share the knowledge of what we're doing on gov.uk. Um, like Ben said, uh, we have this wonderful quote from uh, Tim Berners-Lee that he's mentioned during the opening ceremony of the Olympics, saying uh, this is for everyone. Uh, and that is like the core of why we're building what we're building. And we like it so much, we're changing the design principle of build for inclusion uh, and replacing it with that, just because the message feels a bit more appropriate to what we're doing. Uh, so yeah, we're going to iterate the design principles. Um, in terms of what we do to make gov.uk happen and make it work every day, um, we're not just providing um, code, not just making it work in screen readers, and not just producing sort of videos. There's the gov.uk platform, uh, which is how we publish information out to citizens. Um, we have a digital strategy for each of the departments, so how they're going to transform, transform their own services. Uh, we have the assisted digital uh, process, which is encouraging the use of digital channels over other ones. Um, Ben's going to tell you a little bit more about that later. Uh, and we have a thing called the Digital by Default Service Standard, uh, which is a collection of guidance that we've written that covers like service building best practices. Um, and that includes a big section on accessibility. Um, and we run these things called exemplar projects currently, uh, which are the top 25 most used transactions in the UK. So things like paying your road tax, applying for a student loan. Um, they're all things that get used by a lot of people. So we can influence a lot of like people's activities by fixing those first. Um, as for who we do it for, uh, currently it's aimed at every adult citizen of the UK, plus any foreign nationals who are coming in and might need visas, uh, they might need information about the country and how they're supposed to interact while they're there. Uh, so that's roughly 40 to 50 million people. Um, the site currently gets around 30 million visits a month, 
so averaging about a million a day. Um, we have devolved, admini devolved administrations in the UK, so some laws are just applied to Scotland, some apply to England, Wales, some just apply to Northern Ireland. Uh, we have to take those into account. Um, so it's basically anyone who has to interact with the state online. Um, we've got no real way of knowing whether any of them who are visiting have any real access needs um, because of the ways things like screen readers make themselves available. Um, so unless they tell us that we've made mistakes or we haven't built things as well as we should have, uh, we've got very little knowledge of who's visiting the site, who needs extra help. Um, we tend to work across all of our projects in really small teams uh, with a bunch of different people like developers, designers, uh, user research people, writers, um, and we work in really quick, usually fortnightly sprints. Um, so if we make mistakes, we can really easily and cheaply fix them. Uh, we can experiment with lots of different things, so we can make sure that we're doing the right things. Um, we empower all of our developers to make sure that they own the accessibility of their own uh, projects. And I'm there to support them and to give them any help that they need, uh, right from the beginning of every piece of work that they do. Um, like right from the start, all of this stuff is built in to be accessible. Uh, it's not optional. Um, no one's allowed to opt out of providing an accessible version of anything. Um, because we fundamentally believe that that's how things should be. Um, there are a bunch of laws that govern how we provide accessible services in the UK. Um, the Equality Act that came out in 2010 uh, regulates that no one should be discriminated against by any real basis, uh, including disability. Um, honestly, I couldn't care less about the legal stuff. Um, I really don't think it's important. Um, I don't care about the law, I care about the users trying to use these services. Um, I appreciate why we have the Equality Act and its importance, but I hate that it's even a necessary thing. Um, all of these things should be built to be as good as we can make them without <laughs> legal threats or ramifications if you don't do them. Um, it's not a feature to bolt on at the end when you've fixed the design and you, you think you're finished. Like, the people we're building these services for, you know, they're not like faceless users. Um, they're our friends, they're our family, they're our peers, you know, they're people we know in our communities. Um, they're us, you know, they're human beings and they deserve better. So that's why I do what I do. Because um, I'm given a lot of freedom to actually make that happen. Because um, the people who interact with our site and our services, they have to. Um, you know, interacting with the government isn't optional for most people. Um, so we've built a core platform that we think is accessible. Um, we aren't creating silos anywhere, so there isn't a separate accessible version. There isn't a separate iPhone app or an Android app. We've built one platform, and we're trying to make that work as well for everyone as we can, uh, anywhere they need to use it. Um, as with like most things in accessibility, it's quite subjective, so you'll never get it 100% right for 100% of your users. Um, but if you simplify the design and the writing, simplify the language that you use on the site, your sort of interaction design, like all of those things will combine to make your service more accessible, whether your users notice it or not. Um, so I have a bunch of rules that I sort of follow and tell our developers that they need to do. Um, Easiest one to just start small. Um, if you fix your color contrast or you make uh, like better skip links or you make your tables so, so they're coded better, like all of these little things will add up and make your service more usable. Um, we have an ideal that we all build to. So we use like the latest version of HTML. Uh, we want things to work without JavaScript being enabled. We want to use really boring, usable HTML. So we're not trying to do anything fancy or flash just for the sake of showing off. Like, this stuff should work for everyone. Um, we have to 
design with empathy for our users. Like, we can't do any of this stuff in isolation. Um, I'm a cyclist. I broke my wrist last year. Um, it turns out I'd really badly damaged it. So for six months, I couldn't use my right arm. Um, how you design your services around things like that is very important. Um, so we try and consider the needs of anyone who might have to interact with this stuff. Um, we work really hard to empower the people who are building these services. Uh, you can't do it all alone. Um, we work across too many parts of government and we have too many like, huge problems to solve for me to be doing all of this stuff or for our consultants to be doing it or our designers or developers. You know, we all have to work together to make sure that this stuff is as good as it can be. Um, slightly more importantly, you've got to test that with real users. Um, whether they're disabled users or you know, anyone else, really, we need to get people to the point where they can complete their transactions or complete their tasks sort of from end to end with no problems whatsoever. Um, we're at the point where we're sort of in maintenance mode for a lot of this stuff now. It's a live platform. We're trying to fix things that we haven't managed to do as well as we'd have liked. Um, there's always going to be more to do. There's always ways we can improve what we've built. That's all right. Um, we quite like that it's never finished because it gives us plenty of opportunities to go and fix the things that we haven't gotten around to in the past. Um, Gov.uk is massive, uh, and we're solving some really huge projects, um, especially with the exemplars and the transactions that we're trying to fix. Um, the thing that you're building might not be as high profile as that yet. Uh, it might be more important in the long run. Um, just know that the stuff that you put into those projects like fundamentally changes people's lives if you get it right. Um, and I'm going to sort of leave you with this little quote that I really like. Uh, it's by a guy called David Ashleydale, who writes for uh, webaccessibility.com. Um, and he talks about accessibility not being about better. It's about equality. Um, he says, the goal of web accessibility is not to make the internet a better place for people with disabilities than for those without. It's to make the experiences as equivalent as possible. Um, I really believe that, which is why I do my job. So I'm trying really hard to make things equal. And now uh, Ben's going to tell you about assisted digital. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, I just want, just want to finish up, really, um, just to talk about this. Uh, assisted. So there's two things, assisted digital and digital inclusion. And assisted digital is sort of for people that need help with online stuff. And digital inclusion is, is broadly speaking, for people that aren't online and need help getting online in, in the first place. Um, and we could, we could sort of talk about those for ages. And we've, if you go to our, um, we've done some research on this, which is called the Digital Landscape Research, and breaks this down in much more detail. And I can't remember the URL off the top of my head. Um, but it's part of the digital strategy, isn't it? If you yep. go to gov.uk forward slash digital strategy, you'll be able to get to it from there. Um, so there's a whole load of thinking about, about that there, and you can find out more about that. But I guess the key things are like the sort of web accessibility work that Josh talked about. We're thinking about this right from the start. So we're thinking about assisted digital for transactions before we've done any transactions. We're not launching a transaction and then going, hey, you need an assisted digital version. It's got to be sort of thought about from the start. Um, and I guess the most interesting thing we're doing is we're working with the Helen Hamlin Center. Does, has anyone heard of the Helen Hamlin Center? Yeah, a few of you. OK, good. I thought some people would. So it's the sort of research wing of the Royal College of Art. It's kind of PhD level students, post MA kind of designers and people that are interested in, um, well, in fact, I grabbed this from their website. It's not brilliantly easy to read. But um, they're, they're focused on design research and projects that are improving people's lives. And they focus on three areas, age and ability, health and patient safety, and work and city. So they've probably been going about 10 years, maybe a bit longer. And they've done some fantastic work, stuff that's really got through and, and affected EU laws and, and you know, various things. Um, they're, they're kind of world leaders in this kind of stuff. And so we've enlisted them to help us. And we've got one of their researchers now who, who works with us on assisted digital and is currently out talking to, to users and working how we can do this. Um, they, they had, For example, they had an exhibition at the end of last year about design that makes a difference and featured projects from around the world. One the things that you might have heard of is like BT, you know, make a phone with huge, great big buttons that's, that's really easy for people to use. Or Norway, they've done some fantastic stuff 
around voting, and they've redesigned the voter booth, so it's really easy to, for everyone to turn up and, and vote. They've made those really accessible. They kind of highlight those projects and do, do research into that. Um, there's, we've, we've, uh, we've literally started this like three weeks ago, this, this work with these guys, so it really is brand new. If you go to our blog, which is digital.cabinetoffice.gov.uk, um, you, you should you know, have a look at this blog post, and it tells you more about what we're doing. But I thought it would be sort of interesting to show you some of these. I want to emphasize that these are not actual plans that I'm about to show you. These are kind of sketches from a design researcher. They're sort of interesting. They're a bit, they're a bit fun, but um, they, you know, they're not actual things that the government is actually going to deliver you know, necessarily. It's just sort of we, you know, the first report on the research. You'll see why I say that in a minute. Um, so for example, this is an idea that um, for people that can't get online, you would cycle around to their house on a bike with an iPad, and you would help them you know, do the digital service for them. Now, the government is not going to do that. We're not going to cycle around to people's houses with iPads and help them do stuff. But um, as part of this research, there, there's some interesting thinking there, some interesting ideas, which is can we, if we can't, if people can't get online, can we get online to them some other way? And whilst we're not going to cycle around to them, could it be done with, I don't know, bin men or, or people that already visit your home or, or you know, something? Is there, is there some way we can get to people rather than them coming to us. Another one, um, this is really interesting, it's just you just print the website out and, and um, print the website out and you know, leave it in a library or somewhere. Um, that's interesting because we have actually, with Josh, we've, we've worked really hard to make the print style sheets um, really good on gov.uk so that you can print it out in, in a normal way. It doesn't just print like a, like a normal website. And possibly making that available in libraries if people want to find out information it, it, you know, is a good idea. Another one that's quite interesting, this is sort of, um, they call these digital custodians or digital champions. It's a bit like, um, it's a bit like a neighborhood watch scheme or something like that. You'd have somebody in the neighborhood um, who was from that community who was very interested in digital or very digital literate and could go around and help other people and, and teach other people about this stuff. Or maybe a younger volunteer you know, could, could hook up with some people and do stuff like that. Anyway, as I've said, hopefully lots of times, these are not actual plans, but it's kind of interesting ideas and thoughts and, and you know, stuff, we're, stuff we're thinking about, which just all comes back to this point that accessible design is good design. And um, I think Richard, um, apologies for the picture, but Richard sort of as said earlier, it touches on lots of the civil service reform stuff. We have a similar thing, um, civil service reform plan in the UK. And I think it's that, it's that thing of putting this stuff in as one thing, not having two things. Um, I've always loved this picture. There's a few of these if you look on the internet, but this is um, this type of staircase. There's a more famous one in Chicago, but the picture isn't as good. Um, but th this to me, and like, again, as I said, I'm sort of a graphic designer at heart. This is kind of how I think about it. We want these two things to be integrated and to be the same. So too often you see the steps at the front of a building and then a ramp around the back for people with wheelchairs. And what's really clever about this is it kind of almost seamlessly you know, builds it into one thing. And I just think that's quite a good sort of visual metaphor for how we should be thinking about this stuff, really. But we are by no means perfect, and we've only just started, and we've got the 662 government transactions. We're working on 25 at the moment. There's loads of work to do. So, you know, help us. Please tell us what we could do better. Come and talk to us at lunch, or, you know, contact us on Twitter or whatever, and, and you know, um, tell us what we could do better. That's it. Thank you very much.